nailed it. Yay! <laughs> we worked it out. <laughs> we did it. Yay. Good morning. Yeah, it's the first time. Well, it's not the first time I do a live, but it's the first time I share one. So, yeah. <laughs> I was a little bit afraid, like, oh, I hope um, I do it okay, and I give you access in in the in the good way. <laughs> <laughs> well, me too. This is my first ever live. Yeah. Are you hearing me okay? Yes. Good. Yes. And feel me? Yeah. Yeah. Perfect. Perfect. And well, I know there's some people joining as well. Thank you so much. And if you can tell us if you can see both okay, and if you can hear us okay, and then we we will start. I think Nicole, Nicole, can you tell us, you can hear us both and see us both again? <laughs> Good, so well, I, I get, well, it should, it should be okay. So, well, first, thank you so much for, for joining and I'm happy as well. Um, I can do like a little farewell here as well for you. Uh, <laughs> yeah, because when are you leaving? Um, I think we're going to leave Swansea um, in mid-May, mid-May-ish. Oh. So, yeah. <laughs> well, so, well, this is nice to to see you for for one more time, even even if it's just behind the camera. So yeah, it is still, it is I'm nice. Yeah. <laughs> so, well, just to to start um, for the ones that are here right now, and for the ones that we'll see us later, this is the first interview for well, a new series of interview of interviews that we wanted to do, uh, and I've called them "Women Moving Beyond," and. I know it's the same name as my as my business, but what I want to reflect with this is that we as women can always go beyond that we have been told, that we can move beyond, we can spread all the good things that we are doing, we can spread our super strength and especially in maternity. And well, I just wanted to show how women, as normal women as we are, um, are active through pregnancy, through the postnatal period, uh, whether we find barriers or not, whether we have the support that we need. And, and well, that's what I want to, to show with this with these interviews. And when I was doing the first list of, of people, Robin came straight into my mind <laughs> because uh, when I was lucky, I, I got to meet her and you were showing that before through my research. And, and we also set up a little, a little and nice relationship um, from from the research because I was I remember I was going to your yoga classes which I love I I I really miss them <laughs> and and what I've been seeing as well all all your ways all your trust all your transition through motherhood uh, which has been amazing and I loved all the things that you share as well sadly not everyone um, is able to speak about it and and you did it and I'm sure that's been helped loads and loads of women and well so that that's why I wanted to have you with me as well. So, well, just for you, I'm going to pass it to you now if you want to, to tell people who you are, what you do, um, and a little bit of your journey into, into motherhood. Sure. Thanks, Olga. And thank you for saying such lovely things. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I am Robin. I'm Yoga with Robin Terry, and I'm a yoga teacher. And I have got um, a two-year-old. And I ha was pregnant, and I took part in yoga's um, foot pregnancy study. And I had a great pregnancy. Um, I think all some of us do up until the end. I was um, nearly over two weeks overdue and was induced and then had um, quite a difficult labor and then ended with an emergency cesarean and developed quite bad complications after that. Um, so yeah, so quite a tricky start in the beginning, uh, which led to quite a difficult um, time postnatally and um, certainly for the first 14 months of my daughter's life I had quite um, bad undiagnosed mental health I had PTSD and postnatal depression and I truly think that staying active as much as I could because for the first sort of three four months of Riley's life I couldn't really move much because of the hmm. emergency cesarean complications and um, so I couldn't do a lot of the things I always imagined I'd do with her. I could barely hold her, really. Um, so, yeah. So now I am doing so much better since getting um, help. I uh, see a therapist and we discuss the PTSD and personal depression. And she's helping me work through all of that. And certainly in that first year, I went back to teaching yoga four months after having her. 
And I, even though I couldn't move very much, the, the teaching and the movement that I did do really helped me. I really believe that that first year, as hard as it was, the teaching of the yoga and being active as, as much as I could yeah. really helped me and obviously my daughter Riley through everything. So yeah, so now yeah. I'm super active all the time and I sort of, I need it, especially because <laughs> we've got some very interesting uh, behaviors coming out um, developmentally from my daughter. So it helps me both mentally and physically and everything. And I'm still learning my new body because it's, yeah. it's such an incredible change and experience. And oh, there's just so much. It is literally insane. Yeah, and we have to honor that like mm. we have to be aware i mean i'm not, I'm not a mom uh but i've been working with moms for too many years and i love to listen to all your stories i, I really love that and to know how how you all transition into motherhood because for each of you it's just different and and i keep well obviously i keep learning for that and one of the things i can recommend enough is just to obviously listen to your body especially after birth and just Go with what you feel you can do because it's really important that your mind and your body are still connected and sometimes postnatally that doesn't happen like you you don't recognize your body or you feel like what has happened i i didn't know that this could be in this way so i think it's really important and i believe exercise helps a lot um with that physically mentally not not only physically so i wanted to ask you as well um which is your relationship with exercise? Because, well, I know you're a yoga teacher, so obviously it's part of your life. This is what you do. But a little bit more, how did you start it? How did you went into yoga and you decided it to be your, um, your career and, and also, well, your way of life? And how did that help in, in, pregnancy, in pregnancy? And then I will go more into, into the postnatal. I know you said a little bit about that before, uh, but let's go a bit more into, into detail. Okay, so I've always had a pretty active life. I grew up in Zimbabwe where in school you have to do a lot of sport and we we have beautiful weather all year. So it was outside climbing, playing, climbing trees. So I've always been very a very active person and I worked in the events industry. So again, during events, I would walk up to 20,000 like steps in an event per day. So I've always been very active and I've always enjoyed active um an active lifestyle and outdoor adventures definitely so um so i worked on that then i left the events industry after the olympics to sort of reached a burnout i guess and i'd always practiced yoga um throughout that and it really helped me and i've always loved yoga um and then i worked in schools and then we moved to Bondi and I continued working in schools, um, which was still active, but I decided to go full throttle and do my yoga teacher training and then to start my yoga business, which I've done. And I teach a range of different bodies and sizes and everything. I love the diversity because I really believe that yoga can be for every single body. Yeah, that's what I love, like your motto, like uh, yoga for everybody. I love, I love that. <laughs> oh, thanks, Olga. That's what I really try and teach because a lot of people are like scared of yoga. They either think it's too like weird or it's only for young, flexible people, which is absolutely <laughs> yep. not true. So, so yeah, so getting into exercise and I used to, uh, my husband and I started playing squash together um, for, for that really, because yoga can be, I think we really need a balance of active stuff, like really active and then like calming down you know, like we need, we need variation in our movement. Yes, yes, not of course, of course. We, the, the, the more different things that we do and also in different intensities, the better it is for our health and for our body to be more, um, more capable. Okay. Absolutely. So like to, to really, um, I, I really believe in looking after the whole of you. So like your, your mind, your body, everything. And, so, and just really, I really think that if people had time to just stop a little bit and just listen in to what they needed. So sometimes, some weeks we need to like lie on the couch and rest and sleep. Some yeah. weeks we need a combination, some weeks we only need to be active. And I've certainly learned throughout my movement journey and exercise journey during the transition of being pregnant, birth, breastfeeding, and then um, sort of recovering or just getting stronger in my new body about how much the variation is so important and 
you have to listen to your body. So yeah, so I cycled as well. I didn't have a car. I was cycle commuted in London uh, when we lived there and I cycled here. I, I played with, I did hockey for a while here. So there's been lots of different um, variations. And yeah. <laughs> yeah, lots of different types. Um, well, I know obviously you were active during your pregnancy. You were doing your, your, your classes. Did you, did you keep cycling? I stopped cycling, I think, when I reached between 33 and 34 weeks. I Because um, I got different um, and this is something actually that I want to talk about later on when it comes to the barriers of um, yeah yeah that was going to be my my next question (laughs) so Mm -hmm. you can you can go into it now like because one of the questions I have here for well for all the people that I will interview is whether they found any barriers or also enablers enablers sorry Uh, because I don't want to focus only on the on the bad stuff because sometimes people feel lots of support and people pushing them to be active, but mm-hmm. it's not always in that way. Normally, you have pregnant women and postnatal women have to face more barriers than mm-hmm. um, than enablers to be active. So yeah, you can go ahead with that now. <laughs> so I think, um, oh, gosh, I don't really know how to start, but I feel as though. The, the biggest barrier is probably a lack of information. So you don't know whether you can exercise or not, whether that's going to harm the baby. Because obviously for the first 12 weeks, I mean, I'm lucky. I only found out that I was pregnant at like seven or eight weeks. So I was blissfully unaware and didn't have that sort of fear that it wouldn't carry on for a long time. So I just carried on my normal life. Um, for those first eight weeks until I found out. And then when I did find out I was pregnant, there was definitely a part of me that was quite worried and sort of not knowing how much I could do or not do. I mean, certainly in yoga, there's definitely things you can't do. Yep. Um, but yeah, so that sort of stuff I knew, I knew what I could and couldn't do when it comes to the yoga. And then I think it's also in those first 12 weeks, not and not for every woman and again it's all just so different but you are so exhausted yeah you just need to sleep (laughs) you just need to sleep and um yeah but I definitely found that and I was hungry hey literally I would wake up and I'd have to eat something straight away so uh, my blood my blood sugars were you know it was so different being um pregnant and another thing is like the, I feel as though there's not enough care around um, maternal mental health in particular and postnatally there's almost, you know, that is a very difficult time for almost every woman, you know, no matter how much support or how wonderful your birth is or, you know, it's still a really intense time. Well, what's Yeah, you have, to, you have to adjust your whole life. Yeah. And then also, I think it's really important to discuss the pelvic floor (laughs) and all the bone because so many women get so much pain. And that is actually why I stopped cycling is because my my sacred iliac joints in the back of my pelvis was going a bit wonky and my shoulder was going a bit wonky because you also, the hormones, like the relaxing hormone that's laughing Mm off, you know, without that knowledge and awareness, like, you feel as though your body's almost falling apart and you're not sure. So that lack of information and understanding, I think is a really big barrier because, you know, you don't want to hurt yourself, but at the same time, the stronger you are and keep yourself, the, the less pains you will come yep. across. In a- your body. A- absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And I always wonder, like, because I know some of, some, some of the healthcare providers, they give you that information. They give you information about how you can be active, um, but it's not part of their routine because mm-hmm. obviously they're, well, they always understaff. They do everything that they can. And also the time for, for each appointment is really, really short. And if it was here before, I, I don't want to imagine how it is now, obviously mm-hmm. with, with COVID. But yeah, there's not something that, that is always discussed and also in some research what they say is like it is discussed if the woman asks if she can be active 
So normally it's the pregnant woman who is the first one asking a question. And it's normally people who are already active that want to continue being active. That's exactly it, old guy. Actually, it's just reminded me, I said to the midwife in one of my appointments, you know, is it okay that I'm cycling? Can I continue? And she said, oh, yes, yes, continue for as long as you can. So I think that was sort of the only real time it was discussed when I asked if I could continue cycling. And then I think another barrier is you are just so shattered. And it's almost like you give yourself the freedom to, and I definitely did. I had, like, I think I averaged a tub of that, like, Ben and Jerry size ice cream, like, once a week. Um, <laughs> No, that was my sort of guilty pleasure, which, I mean, I wish I hadn't done because I did put on weight. Of course you do. You know, you have, that- well, the thing is, obviously, of course, you have to put on weight, but is the amount of weight based on your weight before the pregnancy? Exactly. And I actually put on a lot more weight postnatally, but we'll come to that because that was more of a mental health thing and um, yeah. another another barrier so should we talk about the barriers of postnatal now as well uh i want to go i want to talk first whether you found any support to be active during pregnancy okay so yeah and then obviously taking part in the trial um is it a trial do we call it a trial yeah 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 yeah. it's a trial yeah (laughs) i was sort of one of your i didn't take part in your classes but i was part yeah you were you were in the control group yeah yeah i was in the control group so I knew and it, it, it helped me, it made me feel better. And I, I just knew I had to move. I knew I had to keep doing as much as I could. And for me, I really thought like, okay, everything I'm doing now is part, the start of me teaching my daughter, my baby, you know, what, um, what is important, what I believe is important, you know? Um, so really thinking like that exercising with her, you know, I would talk to I would talk to my tummy on walks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think that's something really you really beautiful to do. And I, well, I encourage my mom as well to do that. <laughs> yeah, it's great. I, I especially in those first twelve weeks, I gave her some solid telling offs, like, "Do not do anything bad. I need you to be okay. I love you so much." You know that sort of stuff. But we also have a dog, so I had, to, you know, I had to get out and walk every day because he's a collie, so he needs exercising. Um, and I just love being in nature, like it really soothes and settles me. So walks in nature, like even on the days where I was exhausted, I would still go for a walk and it would always make me feel better. I mean, I think for me, especially exercising with regards to pregnancy and motherhood and everything, I've always done it more so that I feel good. You know, it's not really too really much about weight. I mean, I, I'm I'm a bigger person just naturally, genetically, I'm bigger. Um, but the weight side has never been super important to me. It's always been about how I feel, and especially with my mental health, more than anything else. Yeah. yeah so normally we try to go beyond aesthetics as well. It's more how you feel, and you always feel good when you exercise. So. Um, I wanted to ask you as well, um, I kind of <laughs> slip into my head, um, sorry, because we were talking about, about enablers, well, about things in, that support you to, to do exercise. And yeah, my next question was going to be um, those days, because you mentioned that those days where you didn't feel uh, like moving at all, where you just wanted to be like, oh, I just feel lazy, or especially towards the end of the pregnancy, where you always have more weight and you feel more uncomfortable to move. Uh, what kept you motivated or what kind of things did you do that push you to be active? Um, well, I still walks on the beach a lot with the, the dog and my husband. You know, I really, that was one of the, the bonding. So my husband and I, the best bonding times we ever have as well is walking and talking together. And also with friends and people, I find that the it's the nicest thing to do with people sometimes. Especially now, it's great because you can meet up with a friend outdoors. It's yeah, well, yeah, right now is the only way. So, <laughs> And also when you're walking and talking, you, you don't have to like stare someone in the face, especially if you, you know, it's easier to just flow and talk. And then towards the end of the pregnancy, um, oh, I was so big. I was so heavy and I went so overdue as well, but I walked. Every day I made sure I walked over like closer to 12,000 steps because I was like, okay, this is going to help get the baby out. Yeah. (laughs) That was my motivation at the end. And also you're just so stiff and my pelvic, my lower back, my pelvis, my hips, like I needed to walk 
to like ease. Yeah, any... you need to move. Hmm. Yeah, yeah, I needed to move. Okay, so good. That's that's a good point, uh, and I'm sure this is going to help as well to <laughs> to the women who who watch us or to listen to you to it. And now, yes, if you want, we can we can move into. Um, into the postnatal period, which is obviously different. Now you have the baby, you have mm -hmm. um, given birth, and your whole life has just has just changed uh, into a different one. And well, you were saying you you had a um, a tough experience uh, in birth, and it's like also it's worth probably say like with the actual birth itself, whether you have a cesarean, an emergency cesarean, or a natural vaginal birth. I think having moved throughout your pregnancy, I think it also brings more awareness into your body. So you feel more in your body. So you're more connected to your body so that you, you almost empower yourself hmm. to birth <laughs> and be in your body. I mean, I had a very, not the birth I wanted or imagined, but even still, I still very much felt in my body, if that makes sense, because yes, yes, yes. I've been, um, so it definitely helped me and gosh, um, I dread to think of how, how much harder and difficult and the pain that would have happened if I hadn't have kept active and kept up my sort of movement throughout the pregnancy. Yeah, um, of course. I, I'm not sure. Well, it hasn't been like a study um, in, that, in that way, how being active can help you with uh, when you're actually in labor, how you feel contractions. Um, how you feel connected to your body because obviously it's a moment for you <clears throat> sorry it's quite an intimate moment as well mm -hmm. where you're just with yourself uh, doing something which is extraordinarily amazing <laughs> and obviously the more you know your body I'm, I'm sure the better is going the better your birth is going to be compared to if you were not active as you were saying like um, obviously we cannot compare because we didn't know how it would have been but I'm pretty sure like the the connection you have with your body how you know how your body is able to respond to challenge because when we exercise it's a challenge for our body as well um so is birth um so the more you're used to that the better your your body can can go through birth as well so yeah absolutely, absolutely. I'm, I'm with you on this <laughs> too and also through the exercising and through the yoga i mean i kept up my yoga i think i still i mean i didn't i was doing not anything that people would class as hectic yoga, um, you know, just gentle moving, but at, sometimes active right up until like 38 weeks, 39 weeks. Um, and then even past that, I would just do stretches and, you know, just nice movement. Um, hmm. But also throughout that, like the exercise part and helping you with pregnancy and birth and postnatally, like the breathing like your your lung capacity your breath your fitness in your lungs and your breath you know because that breath links to your nervous system is yeah, just yeah i was about to say <laughs> so that's a really a really powerful to, tool to have is to know your breath and learn your breath and you know diaphragmatic breathing and all of that stuff so connecting with your breath can be like one of the biggest um like empowerers to helping you have a better pregnancy birth and postnatally yeah 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 especially because well as you said like it's connected to our nervous system and especially to one part that keeps us relaxed so it's it is key to learn how to breathe and especially in pregnancy because obviously our lungs are changing their position a little bit the diaphragm is getting a little bit more tense as well just because mm -hmm. we have to give space for for the baby so it's key to keep doing our breathing especially that as you said the diaphragmatic um breath because it keeps our diaphragm relaxed and and the rest of the organs and and our system super chilled yeah. and <laughs> and is i think like i mean when i think back now i think if women were sort of shown their own anatomy and shown what happens what changes i mean because it's difficult because you don't want to like freak pregnant moms out but at the same time, I think it's more empowering. Like, moms are not weak. Women are not weak. Like, we can take a lot. So I think... Well, you, you do. You do. <laughs> yeah. And maybe seeing our anatomy, seeing what changes. I mean, because obviously the iliopsoas, like, all the muscles around your pelvis and your breast, your breast and your pelvic muscles are very connected. So 
if we were to learn, get taught that in our midwife appointments or something like, look, this is how you are. And if you exercise and breathe and, you know, breathe well, this, these are the things that can help reduce pain and inflammation and keep you calm and relaxed. Um, yeah. Yeah, it's more, and I completely agree with you. This is the education side of it. Because mm -hmm. it's not, as you said, it's not to, to freak you out. It's to give you information and to educate you about what's happening with your body so you can better understand what's going on. And obviously, when you know that this is normal and that this, this has to happen, you stay more relaxed. Yeah. yeah. I guess you, and sometimes I, I think the same uh, about you when I tell moms about pelvic floor, about um, vaginal stretch for birth and things like that. Um, you always think like, I, I don't want to, to make the, op the opposite effect and, and to freak them out. But normally what I, the response I get from them is completely the opposite. Like they, they're grateful, they, they appreciate you took the time to explain them something that they didn't know or it was yeah. hard to find in the internet. So, yeah, I just think yeah. there's so much like not spoken about. So anything that doesn't fit to the sort of um, perfect societal view um like it's quite, which is not normally it's never in the way so <laughs> yeah it's never and also you know with social media and everything there's so there's also information overload um yeah so yeah no i agree i agree the more we talk about all of all of it the whole thing the good and the bad the ugly the really gross um the really yeah. amazing yeah yeah <laughs> like all of it it's yeah it's such a it's such a beautiful experience and um you sort of go to this part especially during birth um that this part of you that you just never even knew existed like a whole person in you becomes alive and you sort of shed the old you and become this newer you that's bigger life can be harder um you know just so it's just so much more it's more <laughs> Yeah, and that they just remind me like when I first started working with pregnant women and I was doing similar research as I, as I was doing here but in Spain and I had my, my exercise group and obviously, well, when they give birth, they came to class to, just to show the baby and, and to share their experience with the rest of the, of the women in the group. And I don't know how, but you could really feel that they were not the same person. Mm. It's like something amazing happened to her and and when you saw her like um taking the baby cuddling the baby talking to the baby it was just wow like she met like she obviously well she is the same but in a completely different way um and you can you can feel that from from the outside when you see their faces and and the way they talk the way they move is just yet yeah, something completely different as they were before yeah so, of course it, it transforms you yeah and it's it's such a weird stage because I don't think I'm alone in it. Um, but you feel as though, especially with your first one, well, I mean, I haven't had another one, so but I would imagine it's with your first one in particular. You feel as though you have no skin in the beginning. You, like it's such an intensely vulnerable time for moms um, because you've just broken. Like you just open, opened up completely yeah you expand yeah. this baby so you've got you know there's this extreme innate strength in a woman that's had their baby whether it's vaginal or cesarean and then you're so vulnerable and so like oh that's that is the only way I can explain it is like you have no skin you just like you know you're so exposed and then you you still you 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 know you feed that baby with a bottle feeding or breastfeeding you soothe them you learn them like you 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 know you keep a tiny human alive and yeah, I, yeah. I will have mom saying to me like I'm not doing anything I feel like I, you know I've not done anything today and I'm like excuse me you've done the most important job you've literally kept yourself and your baby alive yeah 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 laundry can wait <laughs> of course yeah, exactly exactly um yeah so yeah. you want to move to postnatal um exercise well kind of and also well physical and mental health postnatally and mm -hmm. yeah where um whether you found barriers or also support for for that period so 
I did not find there was that much support. Um, I don't know whether that was just a unique experience of mine or whether that's just the services are, you know, like we know that the NHS is pushed and even now, like so much more, I'm sure. Hmm. So, um, yes, I, did, I, did, I didn't find much support from um, my GPs or the, um, yeah, well, like enough support, but not, not enough for my mental health because I did say like, I don't feel okay in, in my head and, and that, but gosh, definitely at the hospital, the midwives and the doctors there were incredible because, so what happened, maybe I should just say a little bit like highlights reel about the birth, but. Um, yeah, so yeah, whatever you feel comfortable about um, saying. Yeah, yeah no, I'm fine for you. Um, so I was um, cut two weeks overdue and I was under a consultant because I've had pancreatitis before so I had extra scans and everything and the consultant actually said to me and I remember this it was a big lesson for me this whole thing because the consultant said he would let me go to three weeks naturally and so we would 43 weeks sorry um, to see if the baby would come because my placenta, the blood, the like the umbilical cord, everything was great. Okay, the, the fluid around the baby was fine, but I was so impatient because I was so heavy. I just wanted her to come. I was sick. Yeah. I, I remember specifically saying to my husband, "I'm just sick of life without her. I want you to come." I mean, little did I know, I should have taken that extra week and slept the whole time. <laughs> but, um, so he, I said, no, he said he could induce me. So I said, yeah, yeah, let's go for induction. So the following day I went into the hospital. I'd had one cervical smear um, before then, and I was already at two centimeters. So yeah, I was well on my way, but um, sometimes it can take a while. So I had the induction and, um, and unfortunately those inductions can sometimes be very jarring for your body. So I um, had intense contractions like straight away. Um, and uh, so I had, I tried to go natural with the contractions and I did for about um, eight hours coming up to 10. And I remember saying to myself, um, I'm definitely not having a, um, oh gosh, an epidural because, you know, I don't want to. And I'm a yoga teacher and I can breathe through pain. So I'm going to just do it natural. But then... During those contractions, um, I thought to myself, okay, if she doesn't say, I made a deal with myself and I said, if she doesn't say I've um, progressed however many centimeters, then I'm definitely having an epidural. So she said, no, I hadn't progressed. I was like, great, give me the epidural. So I had the epidural, labored through the night um, with the epidural and they gave me the drip to increase it all. Um, oh gosh, and did I swell? I remember looking down and my legs had puffed out like because of those oh. contractions and not moving like yeah. the in my leg, even in my vagina, yeah. <laughs> a lot of swelling. And then I weaned off the epidural so that I could feel the, the, Your legs and the floor and legs so that I could try and labor and push her out. So we went for that. Um, the midwives with me were incredible. I had a student midwife and um, a non-student midwife. Um, but unfortunately, she wasn't coming. So the doctor came, did an examination. She was transferred. So she was kind of to the side. Yeah. Um, so then we went into theatre and they said to me, okay, we're going to try and do a manual extraction um, through the vagina or, or forceps. So we tried that. Both of those failed. So then emergency cesarean. And because I had labored her down into my pelvis so much, they, it was quite a rough cesarean, emergency cesarean. They had to like really pull her out um, my stomach, through my stomach with forceps and everything. So there was quite a lot of disruption in that area. And then she came out, she cried, she was amazing. Um, she was huge, nearly 10 pounds. Um, so, so mainly my vulva and that area is grateful for not having to push that out there. <laughs> I don't know. Um, and yeah, and then like stitched me up. I lost quite a lot of blood, but again, that was okay. Um, and then, then we had her and started trying to do the breastfeeding and it was just amazing. I was still pretty high from everything from the, the yeah. drugs and the cesarean. Um, 
so that was really amazing to have have her this beautiful pink thing um and then that night uh so they don't need you out of hospital until, until you've had your catheter out because you get a catheter um with the cesarean and everything uh, so I was like adamant to get out of the hospital as soon as possible. So I, um, and this is another barrier that mums think you have to like move quickly. You have to be thriving. You have to like rush yeah. everything. You really don't, you know? So I asked him to take out the catheter and I walked and I remember that first walk to the bathroom to go and do a wee and it was like Everest. It was so extreme. I remember feeling like, oh my gosh, I literally feel like I've been ripped open everywhere. And then I developed something called paralytic ileus, which is where your whole digestive system um, paralyzes. So nothing out your body. So the acids, the sweller, like my stomach distended yep. to double my full pregnancy and just the pain was horrific, like really, really bad pain. So then I went up to back up to the labor ward and onto high dependency and I was there for five days and the midwives were amazing, looked after me and there's nothing you can really do for a paralytic ileus besides just wait, wait for everything to start moving again. So yeah, it was really ex extreme pain and um, I couldn't move. I could only breastfeed and breastfeeding, I'm so lucky that breastfeeding worked so well for me. Um, and so that was really, I feel, what kept me going because I couldn't change her. I couldn't really hold her, but I just let her lie on top of me and feed. And then, um, so that was five days, really hard, went to some places in my head, um, you know, definitely thoughts of suicide because of just the extreme pain and not being able to live like that. And all the pregnancy, post-pregnancy hormones, birth hormones, just the hormones were mental. And then we came home. And I pulled sort of what I think was my diaphragm, my intercostal, so the muscle between my ribs, my psoas, and just a whole bunch of other muscles. I think I maybe even tore some of them. So that, again, was more pain, which was more of why I couldn't move um, for the first sort of two, three months of Riley's life. And I remember being so immobile for so long and thinking, when I... I'm better. I'm going to start doing CrossFit. I'm going to do gymnastics. I'm going to do every everything kind of movement possible because I just don't want to not be able to move because movement is so important for me. Um, so yeah, it's been a real. It was a real test for me too because a lot of um, I, I don't think maybe people who are fit and healthy and not been rendered immobile or had injuries, severe injuries. Where you can't move like it really affects your mental health yeah definitely mm, totally affects your mental health so you know there was a lot of challenges in the beginning of riley's life and of course my husband and i live here our parents did try and visit but they live in zimbabwe so we didn't have too much help and support um in the beginning and it was just a really intense time so when i could i remember very clearly the first day i could so the way, the way I started getting back into moving after in the postnatal period, um, I did it really, really slowly, A, because I couldn't move very well, and B, because I was really mindful of not creating more pain. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I remember being adamant I was going to do her first bath. So we waited two weeks, and I took a whole load of painkillers. <laughs> so I did like bath her and it was hilarious because I really thought she'd love it and she just screamed the whole part <laughs> but uh, what I've always imagined is like you know you see those moms with those wraps like and having their baby close so that is what I imagined doing like really early on with her and the first walk we did I think was maybe 10 days after she was born I really needed to get out of the house and I wanted to do it all you know there's this like funny mum control you want to be the person doing it. Um, put it in the pram and we walked from the car park by Verdi's to Verdi's. Um, if you're in, if you live in Swansea, you'll know where that is. Yeah. <laughs> and I just needed to have an ice cream. Ice cream. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. 
So we did that. So that was my first sort of walk outing 10 days after. And then I didn't really walk or do much for a long time. And then about eight weeks after, no, maybe less. I think it was maybe more like six, seven weeks. I put her in a rack and I had her really high up. So sort of over my chest rather than down by my abdominal area. And I went for a walk literally just up the road and back by myself with her. And that was the very first sort of moment where I was like, okay, this is going to start getting better. And then slowly, slowly, I started walking more. And um, actually, when I started walking more and having her there, I had a whole load of, um, oh gosh, you see, I can't even remember what it's called, but you just bleed loads after you've given birth. Yeah, the look, yeah. Yeah. You just have to get rid of sheds, all of that. So there was a lot of, a lot of blood for a long time. And yeah. because it took me so long to get moving again, I had quite latent, um, you know, bleeding. So that came later on. And then, yeah, just people slowly started moving again. There was definite parts of my body that I felt like a complete disconnect with. And um, my abdominal area, my pelvis was definitely one of them because well they've been severed with the cesarean yeah because well what how it works because obviously they connect her through your soft tissue and yeah. that's the soft tissue they they cut for, yeah. for a c-section yeah yeah so um that all got cut and also just it was sort of the because i developed ptsd and i was having flashbacks and um all of this sort of thing you know there was a definite like that was the source of all that pain and physical pain and mental pain and then yeah just started teaching again getting back into my moving moving body and um continue breastfeeding and slowly started doing more and more of my yoga classes started walking more um cycling a little bit you know just started upping my bit, yeah very very gradual though um over quite a long time and sort of now, nearly um, nearly two and a bit years later, I actually run in the morning, mo most mornings I try to run. It's not very far, literally like three kilometers, three or four kilometers, but I definitely do that. Because I think sometimes you just need to let your body whew, move, you know, move, yeah. move, move quite fast. Yeah, feel it's like one kilometer, just that letting your body run, you sort of... Um, when you just let your body move naturally, you tend to release a lot of the tensions and strains from holding it so tight, you know? Yeah, as we normally are, like, and especially if we, yeah, if we stay home, if we work, and it's not only the physical, but you say also, also the, the mental side of it. And yeah. obviously the, the less exercise you do, the less normally you want to do, because then you know it's going to be hard to go back up, go back up again, and and yeah, it's just kind of a that loop wheel um, that is yeah, hard to to leave. Really but but as you say, like once, oh sorry, no no go go go. <laughs> that once you once you start moving, obviously it you feel great, you feel good, you feel your body released and relaxed, and also exposed and and be able to to kind of free it if that makes mm -hmm. sense. <laughs> um, and I think like when you don't move, you lead, you know, it's an inertia cycle. You sort of, you don't move, but you feel sluggish and low. And then because you feel sluggish and low, you don't want to move. And it's, <laughs> it is, it's that, and, and it can take a lot. And it definitely has to come from you. You have, you have to be the one that pulls yourself out of that to start moving. And even if it's just a tiny bit, um, you know, once you start feeling how good the benefits of moving, then they sort it becomes really um, a really good tool. I mean, especially as mums, like there's so much challenge when you first become a mum. You know, like you've got this little thing that just wants everything from you, and yeah, so it's like I've I found moving again absolutely vital to everything in my life. Yeah, and and I think that's really important. Someone like you, who is a yoga teacher, and movement is just natural for you, uh, say something like that, because um, it shows like at some point we all sometimes struggle to move and we don't feel like moving, but we know like um, just moving is kind of the way out. 
it, it, it really is. And I really like the way you say that, Olga. And the way you say before, like when you move, you like release and you relax. Like it's true. You release the built up tensions. And um, starting your movement is it's exactly that. It is that that way out of feeling um, caged in and stuck. And, you know, you release all those frustrations that you hold on to. Yeah. Uh, we have to go finish in. Um... Well, first, because I guess Instagram will just um, close us up and because I have class at 11 as well. Yeah. And I just wanted to ask you, if um, is, is there anything you would like to know from your pregnancy or postnatal that no one told you that you would like to share with, with, other, with other women? So I think um, also so the relaxant that is in your body from as early as seven weeks pregnant. So that is flattens off your ligaments and joints. So be really, really mindful of not pushing and think of more strengthening the joints work throughout your pregnancy. And it, that's even in your system when you're breastfeeding. So just be mindful of not overstretching at all during pregnancy. And yeah, after. yeah, something that we recommend as well. Like obviously you have to do your mobility work, but not overstretch mm -hmm. because that can cause injury as well. Just because of the progesterone and, and relaxing. Yeah, exactly. And then like really learn the pelvic floor. Get to know your vagina, your vulva, your pelvic floors, like the anal pelvic floor, like the whole bowl. Really get to know that area because that is your base of support and it can really support the heaviness and of pregnancy because a lot of people get pain, like have something happen or just there create this tension or, or shift in the pelvis that they never really recover from, actually, Olga. Like I see a lot of um, my clients that are much, much older that both got that lower back pain or hip pain, pelvic pain from pregnancy and they never really recovered from it. So really... Yeah, because you don't, because you don't know they're, they're linked. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So that, and also be aware of all the hormones because especially breastfeeding postnatally, I had an insatiable appetite. So know how that, that those hormones happen, that, that appetite suppressant hormone that just makes you want to eat and eat and eat and eat. Um, I mean, drinking is so important, like water, not alcohol, but sometimes alcohol, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but yeah, just inform yourself of all the physi physiological changes that will, you will go through and the effects they may have. And just know, like, you're amazing no matter what you do. And, you know, empowering yourself to be, you know, to, to be healthy just healthy both mentally and physically um yeah and if you don't enjoy every second of pregnancy or uh, motherhood you are that you're not odd that is normal that it's is normal, normal. <laughs> <laughs> yeah i love to say that as well because sometimes we think like oh pregnancy has to be just happiness um living like in the clouds and it's like well it's not like that you don't have to like super enjoy your pregnant body or um or just being super happy with everything and when you feel the baby moving just be super excited it doesn't yeah. have to be in that way exactly yeah so well thank you so much robin thank you so much for well for stopping by for sharing all this with with me and well with with us um i would love to see you i know it's going to be hard well we are going back to spain on friday so obviously that won't be possible um to see you before but i wish you the best and well obviously that's a good side of social media that we can still be connected and talking and and well i hope you have a a really nice trip back home and, and well lo loads of love and the best for you and your family thank you so much Olga, for doing all of this important work you know i think i know quite a few months that you've already worked with that you are empowering and doing this really important amazing work so thank you so much Olga. thank you thank you well and have have a beautiful day just yes, enjoy the sun <laughs> Bye Robin, thank you so much. Bye bye. Bye everyone, thank you for stopping. Bye. <laughs>